On September 10, 1952, Israel signed a reparations agreement with West Germany. Chancellor Konrad Adenauer headed the German delegation, whereas the Israeli one was led by Moshe Sharet, its Russian-born Minister of Foreign Affairs. On the following day, Sharet gave a short statement on the agreement and on his meeting with Adenauer. He concluded with the following words. In my conversation with Dr. Adenauer, we discussed the chasm separating our two peoples in view of what happened. The conversation was conducted in German, not in Hitler's German, but in the language of Goethe, a language we had both learned before Hitler's rise to power. Charlotte's comment is somewhat perplexing, considering the dramatic significance of the, of the reparations agreement and the moral, political, and economic questions it involved why did Charlotte find it necessary to close his statement with a clarification on the language spoken? What kind of distinction is it between Hitler's and Goethe's German? Whom was it supposed to reassure or appease and how exactly? And what did his remark on the two politicians shared relation to the language of Goethe mean to suggest? Charlotte was born in the Russian Pale of Settlement, immigrated to Ottoman Palestine at the age of 12, never spent any lengthy period in a German-speaking land, and learned German at home and at the high school he attended in Herzliya. As a Zionist politician, German was an integral part of his social landscape. His cautious words convey a realization that the various historical meanings embedded in the German language have now been overshadowed by the catastrophic events that befell Jews during the Third Reich. Charlotte's comment is one detail in the long, convoluted, intimate, and contentious Jewish history of the German language. My book tells this history, which spans from the Enlightenment to the aftermath of the Holocaust. Today, I will present some of the ways in which Jewish nationalists grappled with the multifaceted presence of, of German in Jewish life. But first, let me say a few words on why German was indeed a Jewish problem. Since the late 18th century, the acquisition of German stood at the heart of visions of Jewish emancipation in German principalities and the Habsburg Empire. It was propagated by statesmen, intellectuals, and proponents of the Jewish Enlightenment who held that for Jews to achieve a higher level of civility and to become respected members of society, they would have to abandon Yiddish in favor of German, the language of the land, and a pure, proper, and esteemed language. In Eastern Europe, many proponents of the Jewish Enlightenment looked to German Jewry as a powerful model of emancipation, were well acquainted with the writings of German and German Jewish thinkers, and read the Torah in Moses Mendelssohn's translation into German in Hebrew letters. Eastern European proponents of the Jewish Enlightenment were often labeled as Germans, Deutschen, whether pejoratively or approvingly. Starting in the 1820s, some German Jewish intellectuals set out to apply modern methods of scholarly inquiry to the study of Judaism and published a vast body of literature in German, the language of knowledge. They frequently presented their work as a reinvigoration of the Jewish scholarly tradition. For their critics in Eastern Europe, however, this work also reflected an assimilatory impulse that undermined Hebrew's status as the chief language of Jewish erudition. German was also introduced into reformist synagogues, serving as the chief language of sermon, and in some cases, supplanting Hebrew as the language of prayer. Abraham Geiger, one of the founders of Reform Judaism, said in 1845 that to him, a German prayer strikes a deeper chord than a Hebrew prayer. In urban centers of the Habsburg Empire, German was embraced as a language of progressive Jewish communities and individuals. Among Czech Jews, German was the language used on Sabbath and in synagogues. The Prague-born Jewish scholar Hugo Bergman described German as a half-holy language, or, or consider this observation made by the writer Moshe Kleinman in 1909. When modern speakers enter a synagogue in Russia and speak in Russian, or when they enter a Polish synagogue and speak in Polish, it appears as a desecration of the place, for they are speaking Goish in a, in a holy place. 
But when entering in the very same place and speaking German, it appears as an entirely natural thing to do. German was thus more than a means of communication. It had a constitutive role in the formation of modern Jewish culture within and beyond German speaking lands. And it was precisely for this reason that many Jewish critics, Orthodox and secular, associated German with withdrawal from traditional communal structures. Put shortly, German acquired throughout the 19th century a range of meanings that rendered it a politically charged factor in Jewish life. No language encapsulated more powerfully the promises and dangers of Jewish modernity. Seen from this angle, Jewish nationalism, which emerged in the last decades of the century, stood at the crossroads of opposing currents in Jewish society. On the one hand, German played an indispensable role in the formulation and dissemination of Jewish national ideologies, in particular Zionism. Jewish national thought was rooted in German concepts of nationhood, and German had a critical role in mediating between different parts of the Jewish diaspora in the movement's formative decades. On the other hand, German was associated with historical currents of assimilation that undermined the postulate of Jewish national unity. In, in other words, German was part of the problem Jewish nationalists sought to address, but also part of the solution. I'd like to make two broader points that will run through this presentation. First, Jewish nationalism involved a complex and at times painful effort to diminish the symbolic and practical significance of German as a Jewish lingua franca to make it a foreign language. The question of whether this was possible and if so, whether it was desirable would hover in the background of various debates in the history of Jewish nationalism. Second, the language question in Jewish nationalism is often presented through the lens of Hebrew and Yiddish. But this movement took shape within a broader multilingual context. My research traces a triangle of Hebrew, Yiddish, and German, three languages closely entwined, both historically and linguistically. Indeed, it is impossible to understand the histories of modern Hebrew and Yiddish without situating them in relation to German. Early Jewish nationalists saw their movement as suffering from a serious language problem. Some meant it literally, others metaphorically. Yiddish was the language of the Jewish masses in Eastern Europe, but most Western Jews could not speak it and did not consider it a respectable language. Hebrew was only beginning to be used in modern domains and to be thought of as a possible vernacular. It too remained entirely foreign to most Jews who lacked traditional religious background. Moreover, early Jewish nationalist writings, in particular in Hebrew, were steeped in religious and messianic rhetoric and were in this sense ill-suited for communicating a nationalist call in secular terms. In the early 1880s, some Jewish nationalists began recognizing the potential value of using German in order to make the Jewish nationalist call more audible, to mobilize the conceptual apparatus of German national thought and to reach Jewish and European elites in Central and Western Europe. Consider Peretz Smolenskin, a Russian-born writer and editor of the most important Hebrew journal of the period, Hashachar. He was known for his sharp criticism of German Jews and their voluntary retreat from Judaism and Hebrew. He wrote with venom against German Jewish scholars and rabbis who, in his eyes, wished to make the German language the heir of the dead Hebrew language. At the same time, Smolenskin believed that the Jewish national, national call could not be promoted effectively without the use of German. In 1883, he praised the Russian Jewish nationalist Leon Pinsker for publishing in German a national pamphlet, Auto Emancipation. This pamphlet for Smolenskin was a powerful key to open sealed gates, as he put it precisely because it dared to use the German language to proclaim Jewish national self-determination. Smolenskin also planned starting a journal in the German language called Palestina to advance the cause and was involved in the establishment of a Jewish nationalist group in Vienna. 
Jewish nationalists since Smolensky waged a battle against the centrality of German in Jewish society, but made increasing use of it for political agitation. This paradox became even more visible in the late 1890s when Theodor Herzl established the Zionist organization as essentially a Germanophone movement. Its headquarters were located in German and Austrian cities, and its main periodicals were printed in German, as were the majority of its scholarly and political publications. In 1898, when the Russian Zionist Nachman Sirkin sought to promote a socialist agenda for the Zionist movement, he published an article, quote, that was written in German and was addressed to the Zionist audience of the time, as he later recalled. The Zionist Congress was held predominantly in German, often to the dismay of delegates from Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Its protocols were published exclusively in German until 1935. Another Jewish national movement with a German problem was the Yiddishist movement, which advanced various visions of Jewish nationhood in the diaspora centered around Yiddish language and culture. Yiddishists of the early 20th century sought to defend the legitimacy of Yiddish against the popular view that it was corrupted German, a mixture of dialects or jargon as it was derogatorily called. Such views had been propagated by proponents of the Jewish Enlightenment, but they were repeated by many Zionists of the time. For example, the main ideologue of Hebraism in Palestine, Eliezer ben Yehuda, called socialist Zionists who continued to use Yiddish in Palestine traitors and held that, quote, here in the land of our ancestors, the German Jewish exilic jargon will not unify the people, but only tear it to pieces. Describing Yiddish as essentially a German dialect allowed Hebraists to oppose the presence of both languages in the Jewish national sphere. Yiddishists proclaiming that Yiddish was a language and indeed a Jewish national language had to address the language's Germanic roots. On the one hand, the Germanic pedigree corroborated the Yiddishist claim that Yiddish was a product and a reflection of the lived experience of Ashkenazi Jews in the diaspora, as opposed to the primarily textual, religiously rooted Hebrew tongue. On the other hand, the affinity to German was frequently used to point out the alleged foreignness of Yiddish. In 1908, a group of leading Yiddishists and Yiddish writers convened an international conference in Chernovitz aimed at elevating the national status of the Yiddish language. The speech that drew the widest attention in the Jewish press was delivered by a 23-year-old Polish Jewish philologist, Matthias Mises, who tackled the language's Germanic roots. For Mises, the tendency of Jews, including Yiddish speakers, to deem Yiddish an inferior language was nothing but slave mentality, self-abnegation and imitation in the face of anti-Semitic pressure. The distinction between German as a pure, proper language and Yiddish as a dialect was, according to Mises, an ideological distinction, not a linguistic one. Indeed, German too has features of a hybrid language, a jargon, he wrote. He brought up various examples of, of words of foreign roots, orthographical inconsistencies, and chaotic features in German grammar. Quote, a German has no right to boast about the purity of his tongue. Furthermore, a mixed tongue is not in any way a disadvantage. The higher a people's cultural level, the more its tongue absorbs foreign currents. Mises sought to expose the dubious assumptions underlying the separation between German and Yiddish. In his narrative, the Jew was not a slave to the German roots, he said. He absorbed it, built it, developed it, until a Jewish synthesis crystallized. For Mises, the answer to the attacks on Yiddish should not be in the realm of linguistic scholar scholarship, but in politics. Quote, once we declare that Yiddish is a national language, its German relationship by kin or marriage will vanish. Mises's strategy was to jargonize, so to speak, German, but also to destabilize the very idea of jargon, revealing its ideological underpinnings. His speech was an effort to confront the Germanic lineage of Yiddish and to emancipate Yiddish from it. 
There were moments, however, when the Germanic roots of Yiddish appeared to be a potential asset for some Jewish nationalists. In 1915, as German and Austrian armies occupied parts of the Russian Empire, several Zionists hoped that this would bring about the liberation of Russian Jewry and agitated for political cooperation between Eastern European Jews and the German Empire. Hermann Struck, a Zionist activist, artist, and wartime officer in the German army, published in 1915 a short introduction to the German Jewish language, as he called it. In the preface, Struck wrote about Eastern European Jews that even though their German fatherland expelled them, namely in the Middle Ages, these Jews have retained for centuries the German language. It is nothing less than a historical wonder that 7 million Jews at the heart of Russia speak the German language, even if in a dialect, which through its well-maintained medieval elements offers to Germanists a treasure trove. He then laid out in two parallel columns different Yiddish texts next to their German transliterations, including the first chapter from the book of Genesis, a, book, a, a poem by, by Isaac Leib Peretz, and the decree of the Austro-Hungarian army to the Jews of Poland. The comparison was designed to demonstrate the linguistic proximity between Yiddish and German, and therefore its potential repercussions. The fall of the German and Habsburg empires at the end of the First World War meant that Germany ceased to be the international power it had been, and German lost its prestige as a global language. It was Britain that, upon its entry into Palestine in 1917, became the imperial center of gravity of Jewish nationalism. While the Yishuv, namely the Jewish community in Palestine, <clears throat> was fairly poor and small, it gained ideological significance given the steady immigration from Eastern Europe and the advancement of the Yishuv's social and political infrastructure. Amid these developments, the vernacularization of Hebrew acquired a central role in Zionist discourse. This created a dissonance among German Jews who adv advocated for Jewish national self-determination while being unable to exercise one of its main sources of legitimacy. In the early 20th century, the imperative of learning Hebrew in German Zionist circles revolved mostly around the symbolic significance of reconnecting to Hebrew. Using it as a spoken or literary language was neither a realistic nor an urgent task. Gershom Scholem admitted that at first he studied Hebrew, quote, without a sense that one day I would really know it. Wartime, wartime Jewish periodicals show that German Jews addressed with growing urgency the imperative to acquire Hebrew. In Blau Weiss Blätter, the newspaper of the largest German Jewish youth movement, the problem of not knowing Hebrew appeared steadily. In February 1916, an article titled How to Learn Hebrew addressed the challenges young German Jews were facing, given the realization that, quote, hard, Hebrew is much harder than expected. The author of the article recommended learning Hebrew in small groups in order to monitor and support each other and, enc and encourage the readers not to cease their efforts. He added, for the Jewish, for the Jewish youth in Palestine, the Hebrew language is not dead any longer. They speak, sing, and play in it. Our goal should be to revive it among ourselves as well. In 1917, a soldier based in Belarusia laid out the necessary steps Zionists should take, exclaiming Hebrew, Hebrew, and once again Hebrew. Only then, he predicted, would our Judaism become more self-evident the lack of satisfaction, the doubt regarding the properness of our Judaism would vanish, which is ultimately the reason why we perceive our Judaism as insufficiently intrinsic. Another determined call to learn Hebrew came from Zionist leader Kurt Blumenfeld, who held that German Zionists must dedicate themselves to reading the Bible just like a German reads Faust. Other German Zionists were less enthusiastic. Gustav Witkowski, writing from the front, started to learn Hebrew during the war and made some progress, but he was doubtful whether it could genuinely transform his inner being. Witkowski argued that there was no reason to assume <clears throat> that the Jewish press in, Germ in, in 
of the Jewish press in Hebrew is in any sense more Jewish than the Jewish press in German. He was skeptical on whether Hebrew in its present state is suited to express European thought to a degree that it is, that is at least equal to other cultural languages. He also shared the horror, as he put it, he experienced when moving from the Hebrew textbook to the Torah, reckoning that in fact he was facing an entirely different language. Witkowski's experience with modern Hebrew led him to question the relation between the ideal and reality of learning Hebrew. Another section of German Zionism endorsed firmly the Hebraist imperative. In 1917, Gershom Scholem criticized fellow Zionists for being overly rooted in German culture. He argued that despite the consensus on the essential role of Hebrew for nationalizing the youth, in reality, their study of Hebrew is scarce and often discontinued early. They should endorse Hebrew in its totality until it transforms their, their spiritual national mindset, he writes. Their goal should not be to say a few words, but rather to be able to be silent in Hebrew. In 1919, Prague Zionist Hugo Bergman asserted in a Jewish journal that the first generation of Zionists ignorance of Hebrew can be forgiven, but quote, this cannot apply to us anymore. It was cardinal, he wrote, to enter into the whole of Judaism, not to stand outside while shouting that we are inside of it. The image of German Zionist culture as hollow and abstract was also cultivated by writers of Eastern European descent commenting in the German Jewish press on the language question. Eliezer Lipschutz, a Galician scholar living in Jerusalem, published in 1919 a triumphant account of the linguistic situation in Palestine. He depicted vividly the strong and delightful impression that awaits the visitor to Palestine, who upon arriving encounters, quote, small children playing and fighting in Hebrew, the swell of people walking in the parks from which one hears time and again the sound of Hebrew. Lipschitz bemoaned German Jewry's spiritual decline in the modern period, quote, German Jews have alienated themselves from Hebrew. It's turned foreign to them. Without a more determined return to Hebrew, German Jews will lose any relation to world Judaism, any impact on Jewish politics, on the events in Palestine. He added that soon German will no longer serve as it does now, as a language in which Jews are able to communicate with each other. By emphasizing the realization of national ideals in Palestine, as opposed to the situation in the West, the German Jewish reader was alerted to the widening gap between Jews who have endorsed the Hebrew revival and those remaining behind. Hebrew then had a symbolic yet substantial place in German Zionist debates during the war and in its immediate aftermath. To be sure, there is a long and honorable tradition of Jews struggling to get a firm grip of Hebrew. Yet German Zionists confronted a more specific allegation, cultivated by others and by themselves, that this mirrored their historical and spiritual distance from Judaism, a direct outcome of the distinctive tra trajectory of German Jews in the age of emancipation. This issue became ever more pressing in the face of the often idealized image they had of Palestine and the rise of Hebrew there. German Jewish attitudes to Eastern European Jews frequently involved notions of backwardness and illiteracy ascribed to the Ostjuden. Yet in the context of the language question, it was German Jews who were perceived and often perceived themselves as backward and illiterate from a national point of view. German Zionist approach to the Hebrew language involved not merely a subjective quest for an ancestral language, but a political matter a struggle for legitimacy that was constantly challenged by competing views of Jewish nationhood. From 1933, the Yishuv in Palestine saw the arrival of about 70,000 Jewish refugees from Germany and Austria, most of whom lacking a working knowledge of Hebrew. Jews escaping Hitler's Germany were received with mixed sentiments by the established segments of the Yishuv. While the incoming immigrants enhanced the Yishuv's size 
boosted its economy and included a significant number of highly educated individuals, they were often portrayed as profoundly rooted in German culture. According to a common allegation, they were the group of immigrants most resistant to adopting Hebrew. In May 1933, the Zionist activist Eliezer Jaffe described the German immigration as a great danger to our revival movement. They might settle in their own neighborhoods, conducting the lives they had had in the Vaterland that threw them away. And they might indeed establish German schools, public, uh, publish German newspapers, and preach for assimilation. In 1935, the right-wing Hebrew newspapers, newspaper Dual Hayom, published an essay that admitted that the monolingual aspiration of Hebraism had failed to materialize. Walk in the streets of our land, and especially in Jerusalem, and you will hear an unwarranted mixture of tongues. The reporter counted the different languages he could hear on the bus from Haifa to Jerusalem, Hebrew, Arabic, English, and German, and added a warning. I believe that through the spoken and publicly read German, the Yiddish language will sneak into our camp. From within the walls of spoken German in this land, I can smell the scent of Yiddish. In Haifa in particular, the sound of the language of Hitler is heard in all its accents. Implicitly, Germans becoming the language of Hitler served Hebraists who could remind the public that Yiddish had the Germanic roots and as such it was affiliated with the language of the enemy. <clears throat> a counter argument to anti-German rhetoric appeared in January 1940 in Davar, the official newspaper of Mapai, the leading party in the issue. Dov Sadan, the editor of the literary supplement, opposed the argument that German is the language of our enemy. He wondered whether this fact should matter at all from the Hebraist perspective given that English and French, which were by no means the languages of the enemy, were equally pro problematic for anyone seeking to promote Hebrew culture and language in Palestine. Moreover, Saddam believed that fighting the German language is in fact an attack on some of the foundations of modern culture, of Jewish culture, and of Zionism itself. Quote, German is the language of Kant and Hegel, without which our present thought is inconceivable. It is also the language of Schiller and Goethe, without which our present poetry is inconceivable. It is the language of defenders of truth and humanists and lovers of Israel in particular, from Lessing to Thomas Mann. And it is also the language of our own, of Berne and Heine, of Lasalle and Hess, of Zunz and Gretz, of Herzl and Nordau, of Freud and Einstein. Is it possible to separate between the different meanings of German? This question was tackled directly around the matter of translation. In September 1944, the committee jury of a translation award sponsored by the city council of Tel Aviv failed to reach a decision and canceled the prize for that year. It soon turned out that the committee disagreed on whether to award the prize to new Hebrew versions of Goethe's Faust. The cancellation was received with both praise and dissent. For those supporting the decision, it confirmed the view that the persecution of Jews by the Third Reich implicated German culture in its entirety. One writer asserted that, quote, for persons of Jewish descent to be able to enjoy the creativity of the German nation, whether in word, sound, or color, this is a clear sign of a certain flaw in their soul. Immigrants from Germany and Austria should likewise be expected to uproot their fondness for this damned nation and its culture, to expel its language from their mouths, to remove its authors from their bookshelves, to detest its poetry. Another columnist questioned the strange muse that befell the translators inspiring them to translate Goethe's Faust while Hitler's country was killing the Jewish people. Such stance did not go uncontested, however. A commentator from the left-leaning journal Al Hamishmar asked, should Goethe pay for the sins of Hitler? 
It is unthinkable that experts of Hebrew literature would choose to take revenge on our behalf in this manner. Ultimately, the anti-German approach prevailed. In 1945, the committee met again, this time deciding to give the prize to a translator from Yiddish into Hebrew. According to common perceptions, the post-war association between German and Nazi antisemitism was an emotional response to the shocking violence exer exerted against Jews. This is definitely part of the story. However, the designation of German as the language of Hitler started circulating as early as 1933 and was employed by Jewish nationalists to criticize German Jewish immigrants to Palestine and their alleged cleaning, clinging to the German language. Associating German with Hitler served as a polemical vehicle in Jewish nationalists' language quarrels, marking a new stage in efforts to unseat the German language from its supreme position in modern Jewish history. I'll conclude. In the political culture of Jewish nationalism, German was a language of power, but not necessarily a language of the powerful. Before the Holocaust, the internal hierarchy of Jewish multilingualism involving Hebrew, Yiddish, and German was in constant flux. The prestigious status of German in Zionism at the turn of, 20, of the 20th century differed significantly from its position in Jewish politics between the two world wars as the usage of German came to be accompanied increasingly by an apologetic tone. Under such conditions, questioning the merit and cultural status of German was a way of exercising political power over rival factions. The Zionist efforts to establish a Hebrew-speaking self-governing community in Palestine posed significant challenges to the place of German as an emblematic language of Jewish politics and culture. However, it was only the rise of Nazi Germany that brought the Jewish history of the German language to an end. After decades in which Jewish nationalists resorted frequently to German when discussing Jewish political futures, German became the language that one could speak only in private, tainted foreign language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, okay, for this fascinating presentation, obviously for me as a German speaker, um, <laughs> so many questions. I, I have one so far from Sonja Gollens um, in our Q&A box. Could you say a bit more about the class and gender implications of German as a Jewish language? So two questions in a way, what is class aspect and gender implications? Uh, um, yeah, many, but uh, just to, to start, I mean, there is a tendency to see the, um, let's say the disparity between German and Yiddish in the Jewish national sphere as, uh, as reflecting a, a very simple uh, kind of fault line between the elites and, and the masses. And this is often how it was portrayed both by the leadership of the Germanophone uh, Zionist leadership before the First World War, and by more Eastern European agitators or uh, um, or factions of, of, of Zionism that, um, that that enjoyed uh, looking at German as as as, as the as a symptom of of, of Zionism's uh, class problem of its inability to really mobilize the masses through the terms and the ideas that actually mean much to them. Uh, mostly in Eastern Europe, uh, and that's and that was a, an important aspect in the in sort of in class tensions, but also in political disagreements within the Zionist movement uh, in its early decades. But it was just to some degree um, hyperbolic, given the degree to which uh, Eastern European Zionists also valued German and uh, German culture in in many ways, were not so ready to just you know turn their back on it or, or renounce entirely its value as a language of knowledge, as a, as a language of, of empire, uh, as, as a global language of, 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 uh, of science. Um, so, so one example is, is Ahad Am, who is one of the most you know, powerful uh, 
critics of uh, Herzl Zionism and who really kind of nitpicked on, on Herzl's rootedness in, in German, um, who always insisted that uh, there is no, no future for, uh, for any meaningful Jewish nationalism without a complete commitment to Hebrew in, in all its forms, in, in, its, in all its literary traditions. But he too uh, published in, in, in German in, in different ways, made sure that his work uh, became uh, visible as much as possible. Uh, he intervened in debates in, in German and he encouraged he, uh, students and, and colleagues who, uh, who were in touch with him to learn German because you cannot really study Judaism and Jewish history without knowing German. This is the, the language of knowledge. So the, so the tension was often sort of constructed and, 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 and exaggerated. Uh, with regards to, um, to, to gender, uh, the, the more uh, kind of significant stages of this are actually even, even before the rise of Jewish nationalism in, in the area of the Haskalah, where uh, because uh, many um, Jewish women in Eastern Europe had access to, or more, had more access to, to German uh, than Jewish men, because the, I mean, Iris Parush writes about that because uh, I mean, their access to literature and, and to writings was less um, monitored, so to speak, compared with, with, um, with traditional uh, men. So in some ways, uh, women were kind of catalysts of uh, self-education and of kind of, uh, acquaintance with secular education in Eastern Europe. Um, but ultimately, at least in the context of, of the Jewish national sphere, uh, I, I didn't see that, that, that the gender became sort of a driving factor of, of, uh, of, of tensions around language. And, and there are important uh, texts that reflect on, on, on the language question in Palestine and Eastern Europe, for instance, by uh, Rafael Katzenelson, um, that that ultimately, uh, yeah, do convey some kind of equality uh, along gender lines with regard to, to, the, to the language question, that this was not something that uh, uh, divided or was strictly <clears throat> But of course, there are many other uh, to this question. Uh, can we discuss? Okay, thank you very much. Um, very happy to welcome Rebecca Grossmann uh, here, who has two questions. Um, maybe do them one by one. First, which role does the practice of translation play in your research? That is, are you also interested in what she calls the spaces in between German and Hebrew or Yiddish translations or things that get lost in translation? Yeah, uh, great question. And uh, it does really uh, appear in, uh, in in my research. I mean, th there are important studies by uh, Naama Shefi uh, that studied uh, precisely the question of translation from German to, to Hebrew in, in before and after the establishment of the State of Israel and where she tackles this question more closely. Uh, considering my uh, specific uh, framework, it, it comes out more uh, powerfully around the question of how to translate Jewish, uh, sorry, German national idiom into Hebrew. Uh, precisely because terms like um, Volkszele or, uh, or, or even folk, uh, which are so cardinal to early uh, Jewish yeah. national thought, uh, are not easily translatable. Or if they are translatable, they actually they take the story back uh, to, uh, to, let's say, more religious uh, or, or more religiously loaded terminology, which was not always the purpose of, uh, of, of Hebrew writers. Uh, one example is, is the translation, of, again, of Pinsker's auto-emancipation into Hebrew. It was translated many times, uh, including by important intellectuals, and each translation grappled with how to Hebrewize uh, the, the very almost vulgar Germanness of the text, which was part of the purpose to make the Jewish nationalist call sort of resonant, make it resonant with with the German claim, and so kind of to make them parallel and on sort of on equal ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but this precisely created problems because by making it more Hebrew lose the, as the basically the core of the pamphlet and and and, uh, and the, almost the stated ideology of uh, of justifying the, the jewish nationalist call on very kind of rational secular almost scientific grounds and not on any uh, longing for 
uh, ancestral land or for uh, the beauty of Palestine or anything else. So, so the, in, the in-betweenness was there and was really manifesting itself in concepts and rhetoric and in many other ways. Yeah. Okay, so questions are coming in. I, I do uh, Rebecca's second one first. It, it, it's, it's a very general one, but obviously one that is important for all of us. Um, what are the particular advantages of, of approaching language like you did as a historian? And what would be additional angles you're offering that literary scholars that you probably met and talked with are overlooking or choosing to leave aside? So the relationship between the two approaches, historical and literary, to the topic? I'd say that uh, literary scholars have been uh, aware of the importance of the of the language problem in in the Jewish in the modern Jewish context and in the Jewish national context uh, for for several decades, uh, precisely the attempt to kind of capture the sensitivities and and the inner tensions of Zionism of of, of modern Jewish culture around language around multilingualism around translation, so. I don't think the very fact that I kind of highlight language or German as such uh, uh, is an attempt to kind of correct something that literary scholars haven't done. What I do think uh, is, is lacking and what I hope the book does is to historicize it and to show how it operated not only at the level of representation and not only at the level of personal identity of writers who are often very self-reflexive about uh, these questions and yeah, the inability to uh, to convey the the, the, the the political questions and the poetic questions, and I and I, and I follow it in in the more um, almost mundane uh, domain of just getting things done, of making politics, of uh, of, of building communities, of of making powerful ideology one that that makes sense to to a, to a broad audience across borders, uh, across religious and secular denominations. And German is a, is a useful lens to, um, to capture this, this, the <coughs> multiplicity of, of possible interpretations and, and voices of Jewish nationalism that often tried in a very almost artificial way to um, presume the existence of Jewish national, national unity uh, while the reality was anything but. Um, so so the, the language question is kind of a useful way to kind of uh, see them in motion beyond the, just the content um, of, of the ideas themselves. Okay, I'll try to keep it in a, some sort of chronology. So uh, go back to the Q&A box. How is the language issue discussed within the socialist Jewish labor movement in Western European states? And to what extent was German perceived as a language of internationalism? Yeah, I mean, part of the um, driving forces of Germans becoming a, a language of political agitation in the end of the 19th century is the emergence of socialism as a German speaking movement, both because of the conceptual apparatus of, of, of Marxism, but also because of yeah, the, 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 the rise of uh, Socialist uh, groups, in, in especially in Russia, but also in in, in, in other parts of Europe, um, and there are there are ways in which this kind of connected with uh, with Jewish nationalist circles, also in Eastern Europe and in in, in and in, in in Central Europe, uh, that rely to some degree also on the proximity between Yiddish and German. Uh, so it, it was fairly easy to um, adopt Yiddish to the socialist vocabulary, uh, for example, uh, because of pro linguistic proximity, because of the prestige that German held as, as, a, as a serious European language. Um, Hebrew, much less so. And this remained, again, a question of how, how to make socialism uh, sound Hebrew without losing either the Hebrew spirit or the socialist um, message. First socialist, uh, Jewish socialist movements, uh, for example, in 1876 in London, where a circle of, uh, of Eastern European Jewish immigrants to, to London uh, met to advance their ideas, um, was held in, uh, in Yiddish and German. I mean, it's difficult to know 
what actually what, which language language it was, and and it, it, it seems quite obvious that again something that has to do with with class sensitivities. The more one Germanized one's Yiddish, the more sort of respectable or at least uh, politically effective it it often sounded to to the to the listeners. Okay, another example is. Um, anarchist and socialist uh, groups in uh, again in, in 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 london but also in uh, in germany and, and other places uh, where there was and, and, and in new york of course where the contact between socialist uh, and anarchist and and jewish nationalist activists um, relied on again on on the presence of both german and yiddish uh, an example again a famous example from again from london is, is rudolf rocker uh, uh, an anarchist who came from Germany, non-Jew, and who became an editor of a, of a Yiddish uh, journal. He just uh, learned Yiddish, uh, or at least that's how it's been portrayed, uh, because that was that was the means to to reach the masses. Yes. So again, this is uh, this is where <coughs> the, the affinity between German and Yiddish was a very productive element in the early history of, of the politicization of the Jewish masses. If we move forward in time a bit, there's, there's one question. You mentioned that Jews could only speak German in private after their emigration to, to Palestine, and there was all these movements, obviously. Raki uh, Fritz and don't speak German in, in, in public. Um, in New York City, um, the question says, I believe, that the German Jewish refugee community in the 1930s and 40s not only spoke German openly, but published a German language newspaper, which they did, I may add, in Palestine as well. The Aufbau opened restaurants and bakeries and seemed to be very publicly, publicly connected to their German linguistic and cultural roots and wanted their children to feel similarly. Could you comment on this and maybe also on, on the difference between the United States and, and Israel in that regard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, important uh, comment and, and also uh, qualifications that, that can be made. And, and yes, I mean, there was in, in, in Israel mainly a uh, certain boycott of the German language, but it was not uh, an overwhelming and definitely not a top-down boycott, but more like a, a general policy of state institutions to prevent German from being heard in public venues, uh, mainly in theater, in music, in the radio, uh, and this lasted throughout the 1950s, while being constantly challenged. I mean, it's important to say that this is not just something that German did not disappear from the public sphere. It just became uh, less and less, or, or just almost entirely uh, problematic and, and controversial um, thing to do. Uh, in the United States, and this perhaps goes a bit beyond what I can say with uh, with you know, with uh, confidence, um, there was less um, uh, uh, sort of a organized attempts to, to suppress German. But the very uh, affinity between German and, and Nazism also appeared in, in the Jewish public sphere in, 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 in the United States. And even in debates in Aufbau, they do comment, I mean, German Jewish uh, immigrants to, to the US comment on the sensitivity around using German, about the, the discomfort that often it causes. They try to justify why it's actually important that we maintain German, because we bear German culture in its proper and, and honorable um, meanings before, it has, before it's been corrupted uh, by the Nazis. So there were different sort of kind of arguments that, that could be made in favor of, of, um, of legitimizing German, or at least of sort of um, giving it some presence, uh, but it lacked the, 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 the very political question that it had in, in Israel as, as a country that was establishing itself as, as a, and mostly as a monolingual uh, with, a, with a clear dominance of people <coughs> over all other languages. And German was just one of them, but symbolically it was much more loaded and more easy to um, delegitimize compared with other languages. <laughs> There's one question that, that you will like. Is there a link for purchasing the book? I think there is a link that Claire has already um, quoted in the, in, in, on the chat side. So when we move on from the period of, of German-Jewish emigration to Palestine, the United States, another 
important example would be Britain, obviously, England, um, should we speak German loudly on the street uh, or not? So two more questions, as far as three even, uh, that refer to the post-war period. Can you say a bit more about the German relationship to Yiddish regarding its post-war association with Nazi Germany, so Germans, uh, post-war association? Do you feel like this influences contemporary disdain for Yiddish amongst Orthodox communities? I don't think so. I, I mean, one thing, I mean, I, 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 I try to say it in, um, in, the, in the presentation to some degree that um, the question of how close Yiddish and German are, it's actually, it's really open to interpretation and there are many types of Yiddish uh, across geographical and, and class and national and in periods. And, and the very idea that Yiddish is, you know, one thing that, you know, that, that it's distance from German is, can be clearly defined if, even in linguistic terms, that in itself is, is maybe too much to, to say. Um, and, and, but it was a very politically helpful thing to highlight, again, for different and often contradicting purposes. But one thing that did happen after the war that kind of shifted or kind of emptied out the, the potency of, of this affinity between German and Yiddish is the, is the murder of, of most Yiddish speakers. I mean, it, it, it could seem almost obscene in the post-war to continue um, opposing Yiddish, uh, let's say, on, on you know, as a matter of principle, uh, it mm. makes the fight against Yiddish in some ways easier, but but also um, yeah less less urgent, and and also because of other uh, generational shifts in again in, in the U.S. and and, and other places um, that, that made Yiddish a, a language that was no longer a real threat from a political. Um, Point of view. Uh, I mean, you see much more uh, nostalgia some, uh, or more um, some kind of sentimental approach to Yiddish, without, of course, uh, trying to, to 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 keep it as as, a, as an honorable Jewish language, but without seeing it as as a, as, a, as an inner threat that really uh, undermines uh, Jewish life, and uh, at least in my kind of subjective. Uh, um, Perspective, and that's not based on, on research, is that this course on, on, uh, on, on Yiddish presence among uh, ultra Orthodox Jews in, in, in Israel and in the US mostly uh, does not dwell on the Germanic roots at all. Um, we, we come to, to Israel today uh, in a way with, with two questions. Obviously, the image of the German language in Israel has changed. Um, over the last decades, and uh, Tamar Rakowski asks about the relatively high immigration of Israelis to Germany, especially to Berlin. We've heard a lot about Israelis in, in Berlin in, in recent years. Um, is, is this kind of, of closing or, or returning maybe? Has German a new place in, in Jewish life today after the establishment of the State of Israel, which is now linguistically at least unquestioned? Um, what, what is the, the role and the place of German today? Yeah. Um, well, from a historical point of view, I can just uh, easily answer that it's, it's too early to know. But definitely, it's uh, it's 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 true that uh, that something is happening uh, with regard to the rehabilitation of uh, of, of German in uh, in, in German uh, of German in Israel. Uh, perhaps not so much uh, an attempt to sort of cleanse it from its historical baggage, but more like to, um, yeah, to start a, a new stage. And, and that's, again, also a generational matter. Uh, Berlin, to some degree, has become a new sort of romantic place, be uh, Israeli slash Jewish. There is fairly vibrant uh, Hebrew cultural scene and, and literary uh, magazines and, and writings that precisely dwell on, on what it means to um, to, to write in Hebrew or to even to write in German. There is an Israeli author who, who wrote a novel called Broken German uh, that really kind of almost uh, kind of indulges in, in this uh, liberty that he got 
Yep. To uh, make sort of, yeah, uh, make fun of the inability to fully com uh, master uh, German and, and, and the kind of sensitivities that it steers both among Israelis and among uh, Germans and what kind of echoes it maybe brings to the surface. Uh, so, so yeah, so there, there is definitely a shift and, um, uh, and, and pol politically, again, German is no longer a, a serious threat. Uh, I mean, oh. the, ling the linguistic <coughs> sensitivities in Israel are now more focused on, a, a, on, on Arabic and to some degree uh, uh, with other reasons, although they are connected. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I think that's, that would be my answer. And, and Hebrew itself, of course, has made a, a huge development since the days of the, of the issue. Richard asks, has modern Hebrew now achieved now achieved a level that can reflect the complexities of enlightenment thinking? And second part, or perhaps has English now taken that role in academic life in Israel? Um, yeah, good question, actually. I mean, I... Uh... Yeah, I mean Hebrew Hebrew changes, and again, I, I don't want to speak as a, as, a, as an as an expert. And the, the paucity of Hebrew that uh, that is described in almost tragic terms uh, in the twenties and thirties uh, is no longer the you know it's, it's, it's not it's not no longer the kind of conversation that is happening today. There are still things about the um, the grammar and, and sort of the economic structure of of, of Hebrew sentences that some argue make it um, less suitable uh, for a, um, for conveying specific kind of, of thought uh, whether you know in, uh, whether it comes from from german uh, or, or, or from french texts but this idea of um, an essential divide that is that is impossible to to bridge that's something that, uh, that i think is no longer a compelling argument i mean it, it used to be uh, but but now I think both the both the code Hebrew really uh, changed and kind of went global in, in some ways, and and, and also the great of of, of of essential uh, differences between language that convey a deeply rooted mental approach to things to 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 uh, different types of intellect. Uh, this discourse too has been a bit kind of fallen into disuse. Um, again, as part of the decline of, of more like uh, romantic ideas of, uh, of national culture as something distinctive and, and protected that doesn't you know, uh, doesn't intermingle uh, neatly with other um, cultures. Uh, but with regard to English, yes, I, I, I can only say that Israel is has nothing distinctive about its uh, adoption of uh, English as, as a language of science and, and as a sort of a, you know, the only uh, global language. And that's not, I mean, that's I think the, the state of affairs uh, anywhere in the world uh, with regard mm. to, to questions of, of science and, uh, and, um, um, and, and, cult and culture and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, and English is still a, a language that uh, doesn't carry the same uh, load of a, of a language that kind of takes you into the culture of you know the Americans of the, of the Brits. I mean, you can you can hear these arguments, but they're not as um, uh, politically effective or or or, or meaningful uh, nowadays compared again to to how language was discussed and and uh, theorized and politicized in the 19th and early 20th century. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Is there anything I haven't seen or haven't? So have we, so Sophia yeah? is in, uh, would like to talk, so I will allow her to ask her question. You can unmute yourself, Sophia. And Joachim, I'm not sure whether you've asked uh, Odit Steinberg's question, first one in the Q&A box. Yeah, it would be great if Odit could elaborate a little bit. The, the, the question is, can you elaborate, uh, Mark, on the links between some of these figures, and I can't really say which 
um, figures are meant here. And German intellectuals, especially during the end of the 19th century, and how did this engagement shape the usage of German? It obviously refers to uh, the late 19th century. Yeah. Um, Can you or could Audit maybe explain in more detail? I think I can, uh, I, can, I can start answering uh, okay. um, yeah, the literature that any Jewish nationalist read before uh, making a case for Jewish nationalism uh, was diverse, but there were some fundamentals. And Herder and Fichte are, are two examples. You, cannot, you, you could not say anything about the self-justification of nationalism without resorting to, uh, to these two. And that, was, that applied not only to Jewish national movements, but also to Eastern European movements, uh, mm. precisely because of their emphasis on language as a carrier of national um, unity and national distinctiveness. Uh, and in, in, in this sense, there, were, there was much to, to adopt. And um, Smolensky is, is one example of, of someone who um, who relied directly and even translated without credit uh, some of, the, of these terms of, uh, of national spirit that, that is carried through language as the reason why Hebrew should be um, cherished as the, as the singular uh, carrier of, of, of Jewish culture in secular terms. So it's no, lo it's no longer about Hebrew as being the, the holy language, but the national language. So, yes. Yeah, so so German uh, national thinkers, um, mostly uh, Herder and Fichte, were kind of the, the most important voices in, in this respect. Other intellectual in influences would be um, Martin Luther, uh, for example, as a, again as, as a model of someone who thought of language as something that can bring a people together. Because Germany too was considered to be a language that, that is ultimately splintered between multiple peoples and, and, and dialects. And, and uh, regional differences uh, oh. that uh, kind of make it a, a scattered uh, collective. And his translation of the Bible and, 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 and his kind of model of, uh, of, uh, of proper German remained some kind of inspiration uh, for early Jewish nationalists. I mean, they too thought that we need our own Luther or we need our own kind of path from Luther to Bismarck as, as a way of kind of building a nation out of the kind of chaos in, uh, in which it's situated. So there were very, very different ways of uh, interaction with, with German intellectual traditions at the time, definitely. And it was only after the First World War and clearly after the Second World War where these connections had to be sort of downplayed or even ignored. <laughs> 